It was the Christmas break of my grade 12 year in high school back in Kelowna. Uh, earlier that summer, my sister Danielle and I had signed up for a mission trip. Uh, we and a bunch of random teenagers from around BC were going to spend a month and a half in December and January building a school in Sagpangan in the Philippines and then doing a bit of a cultural tour in Thailand for the last week or two. The mission trip was pretty sweet, and if I haven't told you about it before, I'm sure I will at some point later. Uh, the Philippines, as always, were absolutely beautiful, though at that time of year it was insanely wet and rainy. Uh, we managed to build the school, which, awesomely enough, I've actually had the privilege of being able to visit twice more in the years since then. Um, but the thing is, after almost a month with no contact from home, uh, getting super sick, uh, and spending Christmas away from our families, we were starting to get pretty homesick. And we were pretty much ready for the trip to be over before we even got to Thailand. But regardless of whether or not we were ready, uh, we soon found ourselves back at the Manila airport, uh, loading up an airplane to Tokyo where we spent the night in the airport and then on to Bangkok, Thailand. Once we got there, we boarded a bus to the Saraburi province where we would make our home base for a few days at Mission College, which is now Asia Pacific International University. And that's where we spent a very quiet New Year's Eve. It's actually one of the very best that I can remember. I'd made a good friend on the trip, Peter Paul, and him, his girlfriend Joanna, and I think maybe my sister and myself, we all went down to the tennis courts uh, on the campus that night. We lay down, we just watched the incredibly beautiful stars above us and we just shared our hearts with each other. I mean, we talked so, so deep. I mean, 100%, if you were to ask me today what we talked about, I would have absolutely no idea. Although I'm pretty positive that God was a part of the conversation, at least for a while. I mean, it was so good, and we just loved to talk about God. A day or two later, we began our tour, which visited a pile of really amazing areas from the Grand Palace in Bangkok to the beautiful Winter Palace in Chiang Mai, the amazing ruins of Ayutthaya, a former capital city which was completely destroyed by the Burmese invaders back in the day. It was, it was amazing. Uh, we rode elephants, we went to markets, uh, we visited a mind-blowingly diverse array of temples and, and Buddha statues. And it was at one of these temples, Thep uh, Phithak Punaram, with its huge white statue of a sitting Buddha at the top of a 631 step staircase that I found the true highlight of our tour. As cool as that temple was with its architecture, as cool as the adventure up the stairway to the Buddha was, neither the Buddha nor the temple were the true highlights for me. The highlight for me was off to the side in another building. There, inside a glass room, were a number of glass coffins, each one holding a mummy. And the mummies, unlike those in Egypt, were people who had only died recently. Next to each coffin was a plaque with a small story telling of this person's life and illness and death. These weren't just any people who were mummified. These were the mummies of people who had died of AIDS. Each person represented had only lived a short life. Each one died tragically and far too young. I mean, there's all sorts of, all sorts of stories, from dancers and local rock stars to partiers to regular people who are just in the wrong relationships. The story that most caught my attention, and which I never forgot, was of a lady, a regular housewife, who loved her husband so much. Her husband, however, ended up cheating on her just once, if I remember right. And because of that one misstep of her husband's, this lady caught AIDS and died shortly afterward. We spent some time in the mausoleum there, reflecting quietly. And then when we were done, we walked outside and around the back of a small glass building and through the doors of a much larger one. Uh, see, the monks at this temple weren't just there to re uh, repeat religious rituals. Uh, these monks were there to run a giant AIDS hospice, 
a place for people from all over Thailand who had contracted AIDS to die peacefully. On the first floor, we went through a large room, open room, full of hospital beds. Uh, these were patients who were about to die. And separated by both a language barrier as well as a rushing nurse, we weren't able to offer these people much of anything except silent smiles and, and prayers. At the back of the big room was an elevator, which we all crammed into. And after that, I don't really remember which floors we were on or where we went, except that on one of the floors, second or third, I think, we were able to spend some time with some patients who were much, much earlier in their diagnosis. Now, for a few minutes, the nurse who was guiding us got busy, and we got to visit with some of these patients. But there was one main rule. We weren't allowed to touch them. Uh, conversation was hard, especially with such a language barrier, but after a few minutes, it became obvious what we had to do. Although it was against the rules, we largely knew how AIDS works, and, and we felt it was safe, and so we offered shoulder rubs to a few of the patients in the small room with us. What I didn't expect was for the simple thing to bring them to tears. See, AIDS is a scary disease with a lot of stigma attached to it, and these people diagnosed suffering and near death had gone without the gentle soul healing of a human touch for a long time. Just that one simple thing, a shoulder rub, broke through all those barriers, the language barrier, the stigma barrier, the religion gap. And that one thing spoke more to these people, the love of Jesus, than any talks like this or books or rituals ever could. See, out of all the things I saw on that trip, and there was a lot, this was the absolute highlight. This was the one thing that will stick with me forever. Um, so, I've been talking about Jesus a lot lately, and hopefully we're getting to know him um, a little more every day, a little better every day. And as we're doing this, as we're getting to know him more and more, the one thing that you should probably know about Jesus is that he was a bit of a rule breaker. Uh, I should mention too, since we're on the subject, that while he often broke the rules, it was always to bring kindness or compassion or healing to somebody else. He never broke them for his own benefit. And with that in mind, I want you to picture this story in your head. It's hot and dry. There's dust in the air. And you can see it and you can taste it. It's in your eyes and coating your skin and your filthy, worn-out clothes. You can hear the flies before you see them, but these days you know you can't really do anything about them anyway, so you ignore them as they land on your skin, in your hair, and on the open sores that cover your whole body. You can feel the sun baking down on you. You look for some shade behind a bush or a section of broken down wall, but it's getting harder and harder for you to move lately because the leprosy has begun to get into your feet. Yeah, leprosy. Now, if you lived a couple thousand years down the road, you might know. It's a bacterial infection that's actually often preventable and treatable if caught early, but you don't. It's somewhere around the year 30, and all you know is your features are beginning to deform, your feet and hands aren't working like they used to, your fingers and toes are getting shorter, everything hurts, your skin's covered in gross, ugly patches, and your nose is almost always bleeding. Essentially, you're living a death sentence. And the laws of the land say that once you've been diagnosed, you have no choice but to leave your home. Your family, your friends, everyone and everything you've ever known and move out of the city into a leper colony where for the rest of your life, God grant that it might be short, you'll be surrounded by only other people with a strange and horrible illness. And most importantly of all, from the moment you're diagnosed with leprosy, nobody, not your mom or your dad, your brother, your sister, your boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, child, nobody at all could touch you and with good reason. You wouldn't wish this disease on your worst enemy, let alone the people that you loved. And so off you go into the strange, exile-like isolation, never to be seen or heard from again. Leprosy. Well, you manage to haul yourself over to a big rock, um, enjoy its shade, uh, enjoy the cooling breeze as it blows across your skin, and you look off in the distance. And you see someone coming, someone running toward you. Well, that's strange. What would they want with you? Uh, when they get a bit closer, you gather your breath and you begin to shout unclean towards them, warning, as the law requires, to keep their distance. Well, they stop and they shout back. Immediately, you know who it is. You'd recognize that voice anywhere. 
It's your dad. You stop shouting and you listen. My child, he shouts toward you, listen to me. There's somebody you need to meet. Uh, his name is Jesus. He's uh, in our village right now. Uh, he can do incredible things. He spoke in our synagogue about a kingdom of love and, and even more, I've seen with my own eyes as he casts out demons. My child, this man has power. I truly believe he could be the son of God. Please come and meet him. I really think he might be able to heal you. Whoa, what? Did your dad just say, heal you? Oh, you've never even heard of such a thing happening, but the hope that sprung up inside of your soul is stronger than the pain that courses through your body, and so you grab your crutches and begin to follow your father back at a distance to the town where you grew up. When you get there, you realize you have a bit of a dilemma. You're not really allowed to be there. If this doesn't work, if your dad's wrong, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. But you realize you're living under a death sentence anyway. What's the worst these people could do to you that your leprosy isn't doing already, only a thousand times worse? And so step by step, you begin to walk into town. And as you get closer and closer to where Jesus is, you see this huge crowd of people surrounding him, watching and listening to what he's doing. Unnoticed, you hobble closer and closer until your heart beating a million miles an hour, you draw a deep, painful breath and begin to shout, unclean, unclean. And one step at a time, you walk into the middle of this now horrified and scrambling crowd. As the people press off to the side to get out of your contagion zone, a path is opened up before you and you find yourself looking into the eyes of Jesus. He speaks to you. What do you want, child? Whew, what do you want? Relief from your pain? Inner peace from all your struggles and torments? No. If you're willing, you hear yourself begin to say, you can heal me and make me clean. There's silence. The crowd is silent. The breeze is silent. The animals are silent. It's almost as if all creation is waiting in anticipation, straining for the answer. The Bible says in Mark 1 that Jesus was moved with compassion and he reached out he touched the leper. I am willing, he said, be clean. With the words, be healed, instantly you feel your body begin to be made whole again. Your pain disappears immediately. You can actually feel your skin and your sores beginning to heal. Your face is reformed into what it used to be. Uh, your hands and your feet are growing again changing into the hands and feet of a healthy person, no longer gnarled and deformed and crippled. With one touch and two powerful words, Jesus has completely and instantly changed the rest of your life. And the Bible says that Jesus told the man not to tell anyone, but to go to the priest to be examined, which was the first step in being allowed to uh, re-enter back into society. The simple fact was Jesus touched him. He broke one of the most basic rules of the time so this complete outcast could know without a doubt that he mattered to Jesus. He was loved uh, no matter what he looked like or felt like. No matter what was wrong with him, he now knew that he was somebody who mattered enough to touch. And that, equally as much as his physical healing, it changed his life completely. You know, Jesus is calling to you right now too. He says, friend, what do you want? Jesus wants you to know that no matter how you look or feel or what's going on beneath your surface, you matter so much and you're deeply loved. And when you're healed, and when you know that you're loved, don't keep away from the outcasts. Because what you do matters. What you say makes a difference. So do your best to act in love always, to speak in love, and to literally be loved to everyone around you no matter who they are. Let Jesus love you, and while you do, let your love overflow to everyone around you. You may find that the life that has changed is yours.